Speaking on developing a clean energy future are Shad Mansour and Dr. Mark S. Berry. Before these incredible gentlemen have a conversation about developing a clean energy future, I wanted to talk about yesterday. What an incredible day. From the mayor's opening to the closing with Dr. King, Ambassador Young, Mayor Bottoms, they really set the tone for what it means to redefine smart cities. We're going to try and follow up that amazing conversation yesterday with discussions today. We have keynotes from Bill Rogers of SunTrust and Derek Schiller of the Atlanta Braves talking about public-private partnerships. We have a really important conversation with Kevin Riley and, and the heads at the Philadelphia Inquirer about the importance of local journalism and making cities smart. We have high school seniors from the Harvard Diversity Debate Council talking about their vision of future of cities. We have a conversation on cannabis and the new social contract. We have presentations from SoftBank Robotics, conversations on cybersecurity, data and democracy, and making public and making our cities safer. I also want to let you know that today we will be opening the expo floor at 12 o'clock. We're really excited to welcome over 50 of our sponsors and exhibitors. We have infrastructure companies, tech providers, mobility companies. We also have the SDG Lounge. The sustainable development goals are so incredibly important to making cities smart. So we're honored that People Smarter Global supported the village. We have a networking app that I hope all of you have downloaded that's been brought to you by Cisco. We have an AV EV Central. So I think we have almost eight autonomous and electric cars. And if you haven't gotten your second QR code, please do so, and you'll be um, uh, in the pool for prizes and other things from our partners. So let us get the day started. Uh, we have Arshad Mansoor and Dr. Mark Berry, and I will let them talk about a clean energy future. Thank you, and enjoy your day. So thank you, Artie. Uh, I wanted to thank everyone for coming out so early to, to listen to this particular fireside chat. I think it's very appropriate that we start off day two of this inaugural conference here in Atlanta, the Smart City Expo, talking about a clean energy future. Uh, just to introduce myself again, my name is Mark Berry. Uh, I am the Vice President of Research and Development for Southern Company. I have about 15 years of R&D experience. I am a professional engineer, and by education, I'm an engineer with a terminal degree in engineering. I also have five years of environmental policy and regulatory experience. Now, joining me here on this particular panel is a research superstar. So it's Dr. Asha Mansour. Dr. Mansour is Senior Vice President of Research and Development for the Electric Power Institute. He is a engineer by training, the BS in electrical engineering from Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology. He has a master's and PhD in electrical engineering from University of Texas at Austin. He is also a Cowboys fan and I am a Steelers fan. So we may get into an argument up here about football uh, but he's also a big fan of cricket. Uh, but he works at the Electric Power Research Institute. Uh, Arshad, I'd like you to, you know, EPRI has been, was a founding member of EPRI in 1973. Some of the folks in the audience may not be as familiar with EPRI. I'd like you to just talk about EPRI for, for a quick moment. Sure, thank you, Mark. So at EPRI, you know, if you look at our vision, our vision is uh, together shaping the future of electricity. And when we say together, together is we work with 350 utilities worldwide. We work with national labs. We work with state energy commissions. We work with universities. And our one, almost 1,000 R&D staff working together. And the future that we want to shape, the future is a clean, safe, reliable, and affordable energy system. So it's a work that we do really for the public. 
to make sure that the future generation receives the same quality of electricity and energy, but it's cleaner, it's safer, it's affordable, and it's reliable. So that's what EPRI does. Well, thanks for the introduction to EPRI. Now, when I started in the electric industry back in the mid-90s, I came in as an engineering intern, and I'll tell you that the electric industry was very different. When I joined Southern in 1996, about 80% of our energy came from coal. I mean, if we had an outage, we actually had to have somebody call us sometimes and tell us that we had, a, had an outage. It was very different. If you look today in terms of our Southern company's energy mix, you know, where we were 80% from coal, now we're 25%, 45% .5%, uh, from gas. We have new nuclear. You know, in 19, 1996, outside of hydro, we didn't have any renewables, and now we have over 5,000 megawatts of renewables. Uh, we have smart neighborhoods, new nuclear. We're doing so many different things. So the, I mean, Southern Company is different. Now, Arshad, you work with utilities all around the world, all around the U.S. How different are the utilities now than when you first started working with them when you started at EPRI? Well, um, I'd say even in the last it's a 15 years, 10 years, 2005, you, you see global trends and you see trends in the U.S. So one trend, renewables. Uh, if you look at in the last 15 years, the amount of renewables we have added, wind and solar, an uh, appreciable amount. I mean, it's... Uh, and not just in the U.S., worldwide. So our generation mix, how you make electricity, is evolving. We're building nuclear plants actually where you are here, but worldwide, there's a significant number of nuclear plants that is carbon-free energy. So I think the generation side over the last 15 years have changed considerably. But another place that we have changed is the digitalization of the system. So there is 700 million smart meters in the world today. 700 million smart meters. And it's not just a meter in your house that's smart, it's the communication system that has been built. So I think if you look at the electric sector today and compare it with 2005, not 50 years ago, I think these two areas, the way we make electricity has changed considerably and the way the digitalization of the system so that customers, at the end of the day, the utilities, the energy companies are serving the public. And the customer, the, not all customers are the same. We say there are five C's, choice, comfort, control, convenience, cost. Everyone has a different element of what they want. And so the industry have to evolve over the next decade to also see how they meet the societal obligation, but also meet the obligation of individual customer groups that have a different degree or desire for cost, control, comfort, convenience. Um, and that's how we see globally, really, the energy system, the electric sector evolving. So I think what you're talking about, though, are the drivers of, of change. Can you speak more about why is this shift, why is this transition occurring? What, what are the drivers that you're seeing? Well, you can say policy is a driver, regulation is a driver, but we take a, we take a look at is the future generation, our kids, their grandkids, we need to leave them a world that is better than where we are today. And energy is a big piece of that. So the drive towards cleaner energy future is going to be there globally over a long period. It may ebb and flow in different parts. In some places, air quality may be the most important thing. But the drive towards the cleaner energy is a long-term drive. Our research, working with Southern Company, by the way, is a founder of EPRI more than 40 years ago. So out of the 350 utilities, we had founding members. Um, we both are working on the same mission, which is how do we get to a cleaner energy future? And I don't want to use the word but, but how do we do it affordably and reliably? Yeah, so if we look at this future, I know EPRI is working on something called Project 2X. I know you brought a slide about it. I'd like for you to put that slide up and let's, let's talk about the EPRI Project 2X. So it's over here on the, on the side there. There you go. Well, so this is uh, relatively new. Um, do, you, do you have a copy of this with you? I think that if you're not, there is, you can get a copy of this one slide 
summary. It's a US focused, we are a global company and you gotta do this for every country almost. But what this does is this provides our research and our work with national labs and state energy commissions and utilities are informing this analysis that shows what is a pathway to accelerate towards a cleaner energy future. And if I have to, after this session, if you can remember phone numbers, then you got it. So you gotta remember six, five, four, one. Can you say what those phone numbers are again? Six, one. And because if you look at it, if you look at the left side of the chart, in 2005, US carbon emission, economy-wide, we are not just looking at electric sector, electric transportation, buildings, industry, was six gigaton per year. In the last 15 years, if you look at today, more like 2020, the electric sector has led the reduction of emission. We will be five gigaton per year emission next year. So we have reduced one gigaton. How have we done that? Energy efficiency, cleaner generation. Coal going to gas, more wind, more solar, and energy efficiency. The electric sector has contributed to 80% of this reduction. And one of these things that we, you know, one of the work that we do is not just research, but research to tell the truth about power to the people in power. Because you would think the electric sector would be seen that's the biggest obstacle for clean energy. But these are numbers. We went from six gigaton to five gigaton, and 80% of that came from US, and 80% of that came from the electric sector. Our research shows we can go to four. By 2030, we can take that five gigaton and go to four gigaton. So, Arshad, if you don't mind me interjecting yep, right sure. here, if I could talk about Southern Company. So in 2017, Southern Company released, released uh, a carbon reduction goal called Planning for a Low Carbon Future, where Southern Company committed to 50% reduction by 2030. Southern Company right now is looking, compared to 2007 emissions, down 35%. And then looking for low to no carbon operations in 2050. So that's very consistent with what you're, what you're saying going on on the global Nationwide, scale. yep. Nationwide. And, and if you look at, if you take your eyes to the right side, you can see how much of that six or five gigaton is coming from which sector? Electric sector, transportation sector. So to get to four, take one gigaton out from the system, we gotta continue to do energy efficiency, it's good for customers. We will need to continue to clean our generation fleet. More coal to gas, more wind, more solar, the nuclear carbon-free energy that we have today stays and Vogel comes online. Yeah, so Arshad is talking about at Georgia Power. Georgia Power has, is completing the first uh, in a generation new nuclear units at Vogel three and four. They will come online in November of 2021 and November of, of 2022. Now Arshad, are, does this cleaner energy also include some vision around carbon capture utilization and storage at EPRI? So on the electric side, so if you look at the electric side, we are converting a lot of coal to gas. If you look at 2030, maybe 30 to 40% of US generation will be coming from gas. So let's say in 2030, US is four gigaton per year. How do you get to one gigaton in 2050? And why do we say one gigaton is one a magic number? No, one compared to six is greater than 80% reduction. And low to no carbon is considered greater than 80. You can get there unless we figure out through carbon capture and storage, through another energy carrier like hydrogen produced through electrolysis from nuclear, wind, and solar, to continue to clean the electricity sector even well beyond 50% clean in 2030. So the bottom line answer is you have to focus on carbon capture and storage specifically for natural gas and if you look at future research beyond 2030, we gotta work now so that a new energy carrier like hydrogen produced from clean electricity is available in the tool in the toolbox. If you put your eyes on the middle, you see four tools in the toolbox. Two we are using, energy efficiency and cleaner electricity. The third tool where actually cities 
play a huge role with electric, electric companies is smarter or cleaner transportation. We call it efficient electrification. And the fourth tool we will need beyond 2030 is a new energy carrier and cleaner production of electricity and carbon capture, electrolysis, hydrogen are all key components. Now at breakfast this morning, I was listening to you while I was eating my eggs. I just want you to, want you to know that I was listening. Uh, you mentioned that electrification of transportation and what would be needed to support that. Can, can, can you re so talk about that? If you look, I mean, if you look at the slide or, you know, by the way, if you need soft copies of that by any means, just uh, let them know or hook me up on LinkedIn. We'll send you soft copies of this because this is a one slide representation. If you look at the bottom left on what we need to do in the next 10 years, our model is showing that with the declining price of electric vehicles, declining price of batteries, it is economically feasible that by 2030, 20% 20 of vehicle miles traveled, it's a new phrase, VMT, could be electric. But to make that electric, there is a significant order of magnitude more charging infrastructure. You'll charge your car in your home most of the cases, but you need public charging infrastructure, which are also fast charging, so it could charge in 30 minutes a 300-mile car. Who's going to do that, especially for disadvantaged communities? Who's going to do that for inner cities? This is where utilities need to step up, and they are. And cities need to step up. In Seattle, um, the Seattle city has a very ambitious plan for electrifying their public fleet. And they're talking with the utilities and saying, hey, you guys know batteries well. Why don't you take the role of making sure we have fast charging infrastructure throughout the city? And those batteries, when my bus is not charging, that could be a resource for your system as a flexible battery resource. So this partnership between cities, transportation companies, and electric utilities, we call that an integrated ecosystem. You can't look at electricity with just one singular view. You gotta bring transportation in, you gotta bring industries, and you gotta bring smart cities. So that's a great opportunity for a cleaner energy future that cities and utilities can work together. Yeah, Arshad, there was a, a opening on yesterday. Georgia Power, one of the southern companies, has a partnership with Peachtree Corners. It's a city uh, north of Atlanta where they are demonstrating kind of the intersection of transportation, autonomous vehicles, cameras, kind of the smart city concept. What's your thought of how all these technologies are going to work together in the future? Well, I mean, uh, there's more definitions on smart cities than you can shake a stick at, but the main definition is it makes the life of the people easier, seamless, better. And just like electric transportation, there is another tremendous opportunity for utilities and cities to work together. So I said 700 million smart meters. The smart meters is not about the meter, it's about the communication network that you have to put from every home. So utilities are becoming communication companies. You're putting fiber not only in your substation, you're putting fiber almost through your entire system. Why not piggyback on that communication system to enable the smart street lights, the smart city, the air quality monitors that you can do? And once again, a partnership where a system, a communication network has many use. One for the electric utilities, another use for the cities. At the end, it saves money for the public because otherwise you have to put two different communication system. Uh, who pays for it? It's yeah. the public. You know, that's a, a really good point and I'd like to, us to talk about how R&D is helping with the affordability component in this transition. Can, can you maybe make some comments about that? Well, so this has always been a challenge. How do I go to clean energy future but make it affordable? And I'm going to give you one example. Look at the third tool in the toolbox called efficient electric electrification. In the next decade, the piece where electrification will have the most significant impact is cleaner transportation. So an average U.S. household making $45,000 annual income spends $4,500, almost 10% of their income on energy, gasoline, electricity, natural gas. That's an average household. 
An average household in the U.S. has approximately two cars. If you look at a 20, 25, 20, 30 scenario, if they convert to electric, they'll save $1,000 from that $4,500 energy bill. You do the map. Your electricity cost is going to go up. Your gasoline cost is going to go down. $1,000 for somebody who's earning $45,000 a year and don't have an emergency fund. Average U.S. household do not have an emergency fund for $1,000 if your water heater breaks. So that third, bullet, third tool in the toolbox, cleaner transportation, is one of the unique opportunity where you go to a cleaner future because the average household has 18 ton of CO2 emission per year. You convert to two EVs, you reduce that by one third. So you reduced your emission and you save $1,000. It feels like too good to be true, but it is true. You do the math. You don't have to rely on our math. And, but an average home, a multifamily dwelling, who's going to put the charging infrastructure? People will put commercially charging infrastructure in well-off neighborhoods and other places where we see electric vehicles going. So this is a unique social obligation. It's almost like in the early 1900s, we used to say, electricity is only for the few and the privileged. Gaslight is fine because electricity was very expensive. But society made a decision that electricity is a better form of energy to use, and we electrified rural America in 1930. I think we have to look at the numbers and look at how electric transportation and cleaner transportation has the opportunity to save customers money, save emission, reduce emission, most importantly, air quality. If you're in city, Los Angeles, go to Los Angeles, uh, the port. They electrified the whole port. It's in a disadvantaged community. They were above the national ambient air quality standard in that region. Electrifying that port reduced their air quality emission, which means the people over there are breathing cleaner air. Yeah, I mean, here in Georgia, the Savannah port uh, electrified m many years ago. So we're, we're seeing that technology here uh, in Georgia as well. So we have about five minutes left. I, Arshad, I can ask you a lot more questions. I could also ask you uh, what the... Dallas Cowboys are going to do for the Super Bowl. This they got a great I'm team this season. Because you were bragging about them earlier. But I do want to open it up to the audience. Maybe we can get one or two questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, so the, the everyone here, the question, the question was how, really, how does uh, natural systems play into this uh, reducing emissions? I will tell you at Southern Company uh, that we are a supporter of protecting both the natural environment while we make this, this transition. Natural systems are a good way to, to reduce carbon emissions and sequester that carbon in the natural system. So I do believe that natural systems will play a part moving forward in a clean energy future. Well, just to add to it, I think what you just said is very important. What's ha happening in Amazon is a disgrace to the world. And I think while we are electric sector and we don't have a direct impact, we need to be conscious. We need to partner with environmental organization. We need to make sure that geoengineering is also a key role that plays in climate mitigation. Yes. So, yes. Yeah, so the question is, uh, does the transition continue to happen in a timely manner without government intervention? So, Arshad, do you have an opinion? Well, I'm a technologist. I believe in technology. So we went from six to five in the last 15 years. What was our federal policy? I think states will drive that. I think companies, corporations will drive that. And our next generation will drive that. It would be good to have a federal policy. But I think we as technologists, and the people will drive towards a cleaner energy future. Yeah, Arshad, if I could just piggyback on that, I agree with that point. Uh, what we see is utilities do things in the best interest of their customers. So as technologies continue to decrease and there's value there for customers, 
then utilities are going to naturally transition to different technologies. So as the cost of storage, as the cost of solar continue to, to migrate down, I think we will con continue to see that transition. Yes, sir. Well, I, I believe in data. So we went from six to five. We took out one gigaton, which is, by the way, 40% of carbon emission in the last 15 years globally that have been reduced was done by US. We did that, and fact check me again, the average retail electric price throughout US, average, inflation adjusted, which means real electric price, has hardly changed. Now, I'm not saying we'll be able to not change it and continue to do that, but one of our challenges will be how to do it affordably. We can't lose sight of affordability in our drive towards a cleaner energy future, and as technologists, that's the challenge. We have technologies today to make it 100% clean. They ain't going to be affordable. So we have time for, we got 20 seconds, so one more question here. So the quick question was edge technologies and micro microgrids, Arshad. So just take a look at that. If you look at the top left, what we need to do in the next 10 years, our model analysis is showing we need 30 gigawatt of two to four hour flexible resource because of increasing wind and solar penetration. How is that flexible resource going to come from? Some will come from batteries, grid connector storage, but quite a bit can come from active demand management through grid edge technologies with microgrid smart communities. And we need, so if you look at what the utility imperative, continue to do what we have done in the last 15 years, but do two things more. We gotta focus on batteries, we gotta focus on grid edge, because that will provide the 30 gigawatt of resource that we need in the next 10 years in the US power system. Arshad, thank you so much. I wanna, on behalf of Southern Company, give you a gift. Thank you. We really appreciate you coming down, taking time out of your busy schedule to, right. to speak to our audience here. Thank everyone so much. Thank you. Remember, 6541. That's the only four numbers you got to remember. <laughs>